All right, film geeks, today's class is all about Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. As far as I'm concerned, the most important film of the year. Let's talk about it. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of All Right, Let's Talk About It. My name is Savannah. I am your host. I do film reviews and film industry commentary. Y'all, it is the last week of April. I was not prepared. I still have a whole bunch of movies I need to catch up on. I have no idea what I'm doing for the month of May. I'm, I have more thought out for June than I do the month of May. May is kind of a filler month for me because my birthday's in June. So my mindset is like, just get through May so I can get past my birthday. That That's kind of where my head is always at when it comes to May. So I really need to look at the calendar. I need to see what movies are coming out. So I know what I'm talking about in the month of May. I only have one movie down and that's it. Um, yeah, it's very unusual for me to only have one ticket reserved on the AMC app. And right now I only have one. I, I, I need to pick up the pace a bit. And I guess it's a good time to really catch up on anything that I have missed because I've missed quite a bit in the month of April. A lot came out in the month of April. That's April, though. April is very movie heavy um, for people who are trying to get their movies out before the summer season starts. So they're not competing with these big blockbuster films because come Memorial Day weekend, the summer season starts and the summer season opens with The Little Mermaid, which obviously Disney is expecting a great return from that. I, I I assume it's probably going to do very, very well at the box office as far as the quality of the movie. I don't know. I don't have much faith in Disney live actions. The only one I've seen was The Lion King, and that was enough. That was enough. Now, you have some of the other live action adaptations that came out years ago, like uh, Cinderella with Lily James. Loved it. Uh, Maleficent, Angelina Jolie, Elle Fanning. Loved it. I thought those were great. I think they did such a good job of kind of taking the stories that we know and love, giving us the elements that we have cherished for so long. You know, the beautiful big dress, the fairy godmother moments, the mice, and the basics of the story, right? Things that we love, but also put its own kind of spin to it in the same with Maleficent. It's the same story, same Sleeping Beauty, but it's just told from a very different perspective. And I think it that was kind of genius on their part. I feel like Maleficent is the one Disney villain that everyone seems to connect with on some level, oddly enough. But these live action Disney remakes really are just trying to copy and paste and give us, try to give us the magic that we are, recreate that magic. You know what I mean? And it's just not working for me. But we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. And I'm really looking forward to talking about this. So just to get some of the basics out the way, this is based on the novel by Judy Bloom, pu published in 1970. Uh, fun fact, this moot book was very controversial was and was even banned in some places because it is very open and very, I don't want to say graphic, but just very detailed about menstruation. And also because it's about a young girl who has to pick her own religion. Is she Jewish? Is she Christian? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But yeah, so this is based on the book of the same name, directed by Kelly Foreman Craig. It stars Rachel McAdams, Kathy Bates, and Abby Ryder Fortson. So Abby Ryder Fortson, she's not new. She was in the first two Ant-Man movies. I think she played Ant-Man's daughter. I don't know. I've only seen the first one, and it's been years. And she was also in a movie called Forever My Girl. But this really is her introduction. This is her first leading role, and I think it's the first time we really get to see who she is as an actress, as an artist, as a performer. And she did an incredible job. So what is this movie about? This movie is about 11-year-old Margaret Simon from New York City. At least she was from New York City because she's moving. She's moving to the suburbs of New Jersey because her dad got a promotion. And now her mom is excited because she's like, baby, I don't have to work anymore. I can be home now. Her mom was previously an art teacher. And Margaret finds all of this out when she comes back from camp. And she's devastated because she loves the city. She's only ever known the city. That's where all her friends are. She loves her school. And she loves her grandmother. She's very close with her grandmother, her father's mother, and who is Jewish. That's important. And, you know, someone whom she spends a quite a bit of time with and just really worried about that relationship not being what it was. But they move to the suburbs where she immediately makes a new friend, Nancy Wheeler, who is down the street. And, you know, I think we all had a friend like Nancy Wheeler. Nancy Wheeler is very much obsessed with growing up and developing, you know, 
Uh, she immediately comments on, you know, the fact that Margaret is flat chested. She's not developing yet. And she's like, oh, I figured if you were from New York, you'd be more mature. And just that kind of it's almost nostalgic because there was so much of that when we were younger, being young women, that, that comparison uh, between girls as we're developing, you know, who has a bigger chest? Are you wearing a bra yet? What's your size? You know, stuff like that. That only makes sense if you grew up female. And it, it, that's the thing about this movie is for me, who's older now, I'm 35 going on 36, and it's very nostalgic because I remember some of these moments, these moments of, you know, wearing a bra and wanting to take it off, getting my period for the first time, and just the, the overall developing into a young woman publicly. Because that's the thing about female puberty is it's very public. Um, we have to buy pads for our periods and that's done publicly you know I, you can do everything online now if you want you can order pads special order them what have you but you know you have to go to the store and buy your pads and even now as a grown woman it can still be a little bit embarrassing but not for me this past week I was just not having it I was tired my period had started I was not prepared and I was like ready to go to bed so I walked into Walmart grabbed a pair of like period underwear had them under my arm and just walking didn't care walked straight to the ice cream and then checked out and someone looked at me and just nodded like yep I get it but it still has those moments of you don't want people to know that you're on your period because now they know what's going on inside your pants that's I think that's the kind of thing it's like if you're buying period products then everyone knows what's happening below the belt and it's it's weird and it's awkward at times and getting past that it's very difficult but those moments of going from a little girl and having little girl worries to having big girl worries and dealing with those big girl worries in public, dealing with boys and the way they look at you and the fact that they notice that you're either developing or you're not developing and, you know, seeing your friends start to develop and wear bras and get A cups and get their period and wondering when is it going to happen to you? Now, that wasn't quite my experience because I was one of those early bloomers. Now, if you're familiar with the book, there is a young woman in this book and her name is Laura Danker, whom they pick on quite a bit because at the start of sixth grade, Laura Danker, Danker comes in. She's tall. She's got hips, and she is very much developed. That was me, minus the tall part. I've been five foot one for a very long time. They lied to me when I was little and told me I was going to be tall. Never happened. But I was the one who uh, was very developed, very much like Laura Danker. She started wearing a bra in the fourth grade. I have been wearing a bra for as long as I can remember. My grandmother actually noticed I was starting to develop breast when I was five and a half years old. So precocious puberty, I guess you could say, was somewhere around there. But I started my period at a relatively normal age. I was 10. That's kind of normal. Early, but like a, a normal, normal early. But I've been wearing a bra for as long as I can remember. I don't remember not wearing one. I've seen pictures of me. I have plenty of pictures of me of being flat chested, but I don't remember that feeling. So that that Laura walking into the classroom and all eyes are on her and the girls are looking at her making comments because she has boobs, but secretly they're jealous. They want to be like her, that that the boys looking at you funny and thinking things because they're also going through changes. Oh, the struggle is so real. And then something that this movie and book doesn't touch on. I think this is a separate story. And I would love to see a movie like this or a story like this. What it's like being a young girl who develops very early. Because it's not just the boys in your school that are looking at you funny. But it's grown men. Grown men. And that's something else entirely. But we're, we're going on a tangent. Is the movie any good? That's what a lot of y'all want to know, because I know many of you have read the book or you've given it to your daughters and you're wondering, is this movie any good? How does this line up with the book? If I'm being completely honest and I've said this in my introduction, I think this is the most important film of the year. I understand it's only April. We have what? Eight more months of the year to go. This is the most important film of the year. I don't care. Um, the, the, the times that we're living in to have a movie that is very much pro puberty, pro girlhood, pro womanhood, pro that transition, that natural transition, because that's what puberty is. Puberty is a natural transition going from boyhood to manhood, girlhood to womanhood, that transition that happens when we are such little girls. It's to have such a movie that's that's 
very positive. It embraces it and s- presents it as a very beautiful thing that is so relevant right now. And it's so needed. But we can talk about that in a little bit. The movie is great. This is one of the best adaptations I've seen in a great while. Again, the mo- the book itself is not very long. And in And in terms of descriptions, it's very vague because this is told from the perspective of an 11-year-old girl who's turning 12. So we're not going to get a whole lot of sophistication here. Everything is from the perspective of this child who is going through all these different changes. She just moved. She is, you know, learning about her developing body. She's wondering, when am I going to get my period? What if I don't get it before my friends? What if I'm the last one to get it from my friend group? And also trying to figure out where do I fit in in terms of religion? Am I Christian? Am I? Jewish. And this book really is a prayer in a sense, because throughout the book, she has moments where she says, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. And she prays quietly, usually at night in her bedroom. But she's trying to figure out, well, am I I supposed to be a, a Christian? Am I supposed to be Jewish? And I thought that was such an interesting metaphor. I'm not sure what the purpose for it was for Judy Bloom. I've never looked that deeply into it. I can only tell you what I got out of it. But the metaphor was so interesting of this young girl who's trying to figure out where she fits in and where she belongs. Trying to figure out, okay, am I supposed to be a part of this group or am I supposed to be a part of that group? And not realizing that she had the, what she needed all along. Everything was right there. It, I don't know. It's maybe it's because I'm a Christian. And so the way we see religion is a little bit different and that religion really is a structure and it's about rules and rituals and holidays and stuff like that, which can be good. But when you put so much of your faith in those things and then they fail, your faith fails. But Margaret already has a relationship with God. It's her own and it's personal and it might not, you know, follow any particular set of, you know, faith or rules, but it's something that's entirely her own and it's personal that no one else knows about. And that's something, and she doesn't see it. She doesn't see that she has exactly what she needs. She's exactly where she's supposed to be. She thinks she has to be where everyone else expects her to be. And that's part of growing up is trying to figure out where you're supposed to be. And so much of what you think you're where you're where you think you're supposed to be is based on the expectations of others. Margaret doesn't realize she's already doing the right thing. She's exactly where she's supposed to be. She doesn't need to be a part of a religion or a faith right now. She'll figure that out when she gets older, as she grows and she figures out what she is and what she believes. But right now, that private relationship she has with God, it's beautiful and it's perfect. And it's exactly where she needs to be for where she's at in her life. I don't know. I thought the metaphor was kind of beautiful because that's very much puberty for young girls because it's kind of this like this fork in the road figuring out what direction you're supposed to go in once you get to that point. It's it's daunting and it's scary, but this movie shows us how beautiful it is once you get to that point and you start to go to the left or the right. I don't know. I love that part. But the movie itself is golden. We get incredible performances from Kathy Bates, as per usual, who plays the grandmother who has a very close relationship with Margaret. And Rachel McAdams is just perfection in everything she does. It's crazy to me because my introduction to Rachel McAdams, I think, was most people, Mean Girls. And I was, I want to say 16. God, that was 20 years ago, y'all. That was almost 20 years ago. Yeah, that would have been 2004. I was actually living in, I think, Columbia, South Carolina at the time. We'd moved temporarily um, from Charlotte to Columbia for about five months. And I'm trying to, I think it was 2004, if I remember correctly. I would have been 16 years old. I can look that up another time. Actually, I can look it up right now. Look at me. This will be easy. Give me two seconds or or longer. It's not like you're going anywhere. I mean, you could. That's up to you. So, Mean Girls was 2004 yep i was 16 years old going on 17 so yeah 19 years ago can y'all believe that so 19 years of rachel mcadams and she is just amazing she's such an incredible talent um a huge fan she would have been she wasn't even born when this book was written she was born in 1978 so she's about 11 years older than me give or take and just to have just to have watched her grow into this incredible young actress, this incredible young woman, and to see that she's now old enough to play somebody's mom. It's kind of crazy. It's 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 kind of crazy. But here she is, and she is she has a way of just being very cool 
in a performance. She just kind of rides it very easy and she navigates it. She doesn't think too much. She doesn't work too hard. She doesn't try too hard. She's just able to kind of slip into a performance and into a role and she just rests. And I love that about her. There's something very subdued about the way Rachel McAdams takes on a role. So I thought she was perfect for this as the mother. Now, if you have read the book, so I'm going to go back and forth between the book and the movie because I know there are a lot of people who are wondering. We don't get a lot from the mother in the book. We really don't see a lot of the relationship between Margaret and her mother, Barbara. But this movie is able to take that and expand on it. Now, if we just got a movie that's just just the book, that just went by the book, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, just the book. The movie itself, I think, would be maybe 30 minutes long. So you have to add some things in there to give us a much fuller story while using the book as a framework, kind of a blueprint. So you still have this story from the book, but this is more of a guide in a sense, a timeline. So we have, you know, our book acting as a timeline and we're able to kind of, you know, slip things kind of in between to kind of fill in some of the gaps and the spaces in which the book you know, leaves kind of empty. So the relationship between Margaret and Barbara, we don't really get a whole lot of that in the book. Uh, the relationships, the really, really deep, intense relationship between Margaret and her grandmother, we get a bit of that in the book, but not a whole lot. And this kind of widens that, you know, motherhood, what, you know, what motherhood and being an adult is like as a woman, we don't really get that in the book. So we get that from Barbara and also being a woman at an older age. We get that from Sylvia played by Kathy Bates. This is why I love this movie because this isn't just a movie that's pro female puberty. This is a movie that's really just pro womanhood in general, just the many facets of being a girl. So you have, you know, young girl who is carefree, not a care in the world. And then all of a sudden we have, you know, pre-adolescence and adolescence where she comes into her own as a woman coming those, those first steps of womanhood at the very end, spoiler alert. I, I make sure I'll, I know y'all get some of y'all get mad at me because I don't mention spoilers. I just be talking, but spoiler alert. Cause at the end of the movie, she gets her period and she's just, you know, crying and she's happy about it. Good for her. Cause Lord knows I thought I was dying again margaret is 12 years old when she gets her period i was 10 my mom and i had had like brief conversations here and there so i knew what when she you know when i heard the word period i knew what people were talking about but it's something else when it happens to you you know it's coming you know what it is you know that at some point you're going to start bleeding but once that moment in and of itself i don't think we talk about that a whole lot but it can be a bit traumatic even if for a second because holy crap you're bleeding and there's blood in your underwear. You know what it is. If you've been, you've had those conversations, you've been educated, you know what it is, but nothing really pre prepares you for that sight of blood in your underwear or sitting up, standing up to flush the toilet and there's blood in the toilet. Like no, nothing prepares you for that. I got my period in my sleep and woke up and there was blood in my underwear. Thought I was dying, ran to my mom, scared. And she's like, so happy. She's crying, Savannah, you got your period. And I'm like, Okay, cool. But like, are we going to the hospital though? Like, what are we doing? Like I was, I thought I was dying. <laughs> and once, you know, my mom being happy about it irritated me a little bit, but it also calmed me down because, you know, this is my mother. And if she's not concerned, why should I be concerned? You know, she thought it was a good thing. Even marked it on the calendar, October 20th, 1997. Yep. She marked it on the calendar. I never forgot it. And that moment where you're not a little girl anymore and you're you now got woman problems it's it's something that transition where everything changes and it's it's scary but it's it's cool and it's beautiful but it's also awkward and it's scary because again these changes are very public everyone can see that you're getting hips everyone can see that you're starting to kind of develop a womanly shape not just in your hips but also in your face your shoulders your legs go i went from like flat stanley super skinny to thighs seemingly overnight all of a sudden being a little girl in a woman's body i don't know how to really emphasize how scary that struggle can be in a world full of men who are looking at you a certain way. And uh, I, it, it's, 
growing up female can be very stressful but this movie really is just pro womanhood because we get the you know the little girl pre-adolescence adolescence and then we get a picture of what womanhood is like when you're grown and you're a mother and some of the female struggles that we have because there's something innate in us and a lot of people want to blame this on culture no this is very innate in us and it can be made worse by the culture sometimes this wanting to kind of please everyone and be helpful and nurturing and be a home and figuring out what, how to create a space where people feel welcomed and loved and appreciated. And this can sometimes be made worse by culture that expects so much of women. We have to do, be able to do everything. We have to be able to work a nine to five, be a boss babe, be a wife, be a mother, how to be all the things. And we get a bit of this struggle in Barbara Simon, Rachel McAdams character, and the thing is, this is something a lot of women deal with. It's innate. There's something in our DNA, the way we are designed to be this way. But we live in a culture that sometimes makes it very difficult or can make things worse. Or we live in a culture that tells us to not be that thing. And so we go about life miserable, wondering why am I just not enjoying life? Well, we're not being who we were designed to be. I think that can be part of the issue. And also then you have this older woman, Sylvia, who is past retirement age and getting to the point where she's no longer needed. You know, she her son is married with a wife and a granddaughter and she's, you know, developed this beautiful relationship with her granddaughter. They're very close. They're like best friends. And but now she's moved away. And so she's trying to figure out where she's needed, wh what to do with her time and her life and just trying to revive something that struggle right there. It's, it's just all encompassing and it's just it's almost like group therapy. There's there's some kind of solidarity with it all, especially living in this culture that's trying to attack and redefine womanhood. And just this gentle reminder that it's a birthright. Essentially. I don't know. I thought the movie was excellent. I think this is great for girls between the ages of nine and 14. So if you're a mom with daughters, I highly recommend you don't just, you know, drop them off, but you go with them, watch the movie with them, go out to eat afterwards, ice cream, coffee, and then ha talk about it. Have that conversation. Highly recommend. I think for older women, so, you know, 18 and up, you know, we've already been through all this. I think this is a great girls night out kind of movie because it's nostalgic. This is something we can all relate to. This is our story. This is, we can all relate to this on some level, whether you're a Margaret Simon and you're waiting for all the things to happen or you're a Laura Danker and all the things have happened and you're just watching everyone else in slow motion. I think this is something for everybody, but I think this is a beautiful tale of womanhood and girlhood. And I think in the times in which we're living in, a movie that embraces the beauty of female puberty is so necessary and so needed. So as far as I, can, I am concerned, yes, this is the most important movie of the year. So this is the part where I get a little controversial. Why is this movie so important? I want to just dig deeper into that. So I might say some things that might upset your nerves. Quick disclaimer, you can call me all the names in the world. It bothers me not. I have been called all of it. I don't care. That's a you problem, not a me problem. So why is this movie so important? I'm not one to get into extremes or, you know, crazy cliches, but, you know, people are saying, you know, girlhood or womanhood is under attack. I think there is some merit to that because there is a lot of pressure on women to accept a redefining of the word woman and also a redefining of the word womanhood but this movie here i think takes it back to the foundation of womanhood because womanhood doesn't start for us when we become adults it doesn't start when our brains fully develop at the age of 25 it doesn't start when we realize hey i'm an adult and i have to pay bills it starts when we are children we came into womanhood as children when we were still minors you know, I was 10 years old when I got my period. I've been wearing a bra for as long as I can remember. I remember being at the mall. I had to be, I had to have been somewhere between like 10, 11, and 12, somewhere around there. And remember, I was very much developed. I was a B cup in the fourth grade. So very much a child in a woman's body. I don't know how to, else to emphasize that, but I think if you're a young woman and you developed early, you get it. 
you understand the struggle that comes with that. And this is what I'm talking about here. So this happened at the mall. It was one of those stores that has um, the vibrating chairs, you know, the, you know, something you can put in your living room. It gives you a massage. And me being a kid, I found one of the chairs, turned it on while my mom was talking or doing something. And I have the chair on vibrating and I'm just like having a good old time, you know, uh, making noises, you know, just saying random vowels and listening to my voice shake. And as I'm minding my own business, not bothering anybody, because I'm not the only one enjoying the fun chairs, my mom pulls me out of the chair real quick, just snatches me up out of it and I'm and turns it off. And she says, don't do that no more. Don't get in the chair anymore. Um, real quick, real stern like that. And I was like, why? What did I do? She says, nothing. you didn't do nothing wrong. And I, But I'm not really hearing that at the time. I get it now. But I was like, why not? Why not? She said, the man over there. There was a man kind of over off to the side. She said, he's getting a thrill watching you. Me not me being so young and so so innocent, I'm just having a good old time, not realizing, not even thinking that when I'm sitting in this chair and it's vibrating, my breasts are shaking. And there was an older gentleman across the way who was watching me and I didn't even know, but my mom saw and she quickly pulled me and took me with her. That's what we have to deal with a lot of the times, it's it's not just young boys giving us a hard time because we're either developing too fast or we're not developing at all. It's not just, you know, our girlfriends comparing and contrasting saying, well, I got my period. I use pads. Life use tampons. And well, you know, I'm a B cup now. I'm A cup now. There was a moment in the movie. It just took me back. I remember being in the fourth grade and my best friend at the time named Brandy. She was starting to wear a bra. I'd already been wearing a bra. But I remember when she was starting to wear a bra and something we used to do to one another was snap our bra straps. Well, in the movie, they have a secret club, Margaret and her three friends. And one of the rules is if you come to, you're in the club, you have to wear a bra. She don't need a bra, but her she tells her, my mom, I want to buy a bra. Her mom doesn't question it. It's like, okay, if you feel like you need one, we'll go get you a bra. So she shows up to their first little secret meeting and Nancy, who's the leader of the group, snaps their bra straps to check to see if they're wearing a bra. And that took me back, y'all. That took me back. But this is the foundation of it all. This is where it starts. This is where womanhood starts. When our bodies be change and we jump into womanhood, whether we're ready for it or not. And it's scary. And it's it's hard. And it's difficult. There are a lot of changes, a lot of moods that are happening. You're crying. You're upset. You're mad. You're impulsive. You get mean for no reason. Acne. Now you're starting to worry about things you weren't worrying about before because now that your body is maturing, that means you're getting fat. Not just like fat, like obese fat, but like body fat. You're starting to get fat in places you didn't have it before on your thighs, on your stomach and on your chest. And clothes don't look the same anymore. Everything looks different. And you feel like an alien in your own body. And at times you just want to escape it. That's normal. I don't know what little girl out here needs to hear this, but are, are, you, are you, what, 12 years old and all of a sudden you feel like an alien in your own skin? You don't like your body? You don't like the changes? You really don't want to? That's normal, baby. That's puberty. That's puberty. Your mama felt that way. Your grandmother felt that way. We all feel that way. And trust me when I tell you, it gets better. You get past it. Eventually, sometimes it happens within a couple of years, sometimes within a couple of decades, you get to a point where you say, I love the skin that I'm in. I love my body as it is. It takes a minute, but we're like, you know, yearling fillies. You know, have you ever seen a year old horse? They're awkward looking. They're gangly and just, uh, we're, we're, that's basically us, okay? We're basically baby horses trying to figure it all out. We're awkward looking. We're funny shaped and nothing makes sense and nothing fits right. And this movie really embraces or pushes or teaches young girls to really embrace that change and not to run from it. Because when we live in a culture right now that is in, that's encouraging young girls to run from it. That's where we're at right now. So we, we talk about gender dysphoria, right? And the trans movement. And there's this uptick of young girls who are seeing go into gender clinics and they're getting puberty blockers and testosterone. That's not normal, y'all. When it comes to gender dysphoria, it's mainly a male affliction. Not to say that women don't get gender dysphoria. It does happen, but it's incredibly rare. And when it happens, it's severe. But it's it's this uptick in young girls who are getting it, girls who never displayed any kind of dysphoria prior to puberty, get to puberty and they feel like 
something's wrong with them. No, baby, nothing's wrong with you. You're in puberty. And instead of telling these girls the truth that, hey, your body's just going through a lot of changes, you know, you're getting your period, you're growing breasts, you're getting hips, everything feels weird. Womanhood can be very scary. And womanhood at times can be very dangerous because once you become a woman, once you become aware of your, the, the body changes that happens, you become hypervigilant. You can become very much aware of how other men look at you and how almost how much weaker you are physically, because as you are filling out, boys are growing up. Not to say that girls don't get tall, but on average, you really start to notice the difference because before that y'all were all, y'all were all on the same page. You all kind of looked alike. Now you're noticing that boys are different. Boys are bigger. Boys are stronger. Boys are a little more intimidating and the world is that much more dangerous. And that's, it's almost, you want to run from that. That's natural. That's a normal, natural feeling. It makes sense to want to run from the dangers of this world because womanhood can be a very precarious existence but it's a beautiful one but so many young girls are getting this message that yes if you want to run from it i'll help you run away i'll fund your runaway efforts from womanhood we'll put you on puberty blockers so that you don't develop anymore we'll put you on testosterone so that you can become more like a man and you don't have to be the weak person in the bunch you can be like the strong men who scare you if you talk to a lot of the women women who are detransitioning and really hear their stories, a lot of it's the same. It's not so much they wanted to become men, they just didn't want to become women. They were afraid of womanhood and all that comes with it. When you're that young, it's hard to see past the next year. It's, it's hard to see to the next day. I remember being very young and in high school and I was very depressed and I had a hard time seeing past 18. I had a hard time seeing that there was life beyond graduation. I, I think this movie is incredibly timely because so many girls are being spoon fed this lie that puberty is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to them. That becoming a woman is the worst thing that can ever happen to you. That being a woman is just a bad thing. Yes, there are a lot of things that happen to women that are absolutely awful, but feeding young girls this lie that life sucks as a woman, that life does not get better, that you're weak, that you're always going to be oppressed. There's this big old patriarchy that's ready to put you down because you're a woman feeding them these lies and they're in the middle of their most, the most vulnerable, vulnerable time of their lives. Anyone here watch Vampire Diaries? I watched up until I think season maybe five. And um, once Klaus and them left, I, I was done. Um, Cause I, I was mad that the, the creators of the show didn't, you know, make Caroline and Klaus in game. And I really kind of stopped watching after that because they, Klaus was it for me. Well, remember when we were introduced to Klaus, for those who don't know, uh, Vampire Diaries obviously is a show about vampires. We have Klaus, who was one of the oldest vampires. It's his family that kind of started the vampire line. And he is a hybrid. He is a werewolf vampire hybrid. However, his werewolf side has been suppressed his entire life, but he's finally gotten all the tools to break the curse so that he can wolf out whenever he wants to. But he has his brother here who's, you know, determined to destroy him. And he tells, you know, Elena, Damon, and Stefan that, hey, we have, in order to kill Klaus, because you can't, you know, stab him to the heart, you can't, you know, do silver or anything like that, you know, none of that stuff works. You have to pull out his heart. And the only time to do that is when he's in transition, because when he's in transition, meaning when he starts to change into a wolf, that's when he's most vulnerable. That's when you got to kill him. That's where these young girls are at. They're in transition. They're in transition from girl to woman. And this is when they're most vulnerable. And you have a lot of money hungry adults who are taking advantage of that. And it upsets me to no end. But I'm so glad this movie is out. And I hope a lot of young women see it. If not young women, they're mothers. Because moms, we have, a, I'm not a mom, but women, we have a responsibility to tell our girls the truth. Yes, puberty is scary. Yes, you're, you're, yes, getting your period for the first time is a little daunting. And yeah, it hurts. Yes, the cramps are awful. Yes, you're going to be crying and moody for no reason. You don't understand why. But it's beautiful. Being a woman is incredible. The female body itself is a miracle. It's a miracle. You can't convince me otherwise. If I was ever unsure there was a God, the way the female body just operates, the design, 
It's incredible. It's a miracle. What our bodies are capable of, what our bodies can do. We're superheroes. We're amazing. The continuation of our human species does not happen without, it, it's, it's all about us. We are the most powerful being on the planet as far as I'm concerned. And women and young girls need to hear that. Your daughters who are coming up into puberty, they need to hear that. That they're not weak because they're women. Yes, the world is hard. And yes, there are people who are trying to put them down, keep them down, hurt them because they are women. But it's because we are so strong. There is something about our strength that is intimidating. I think this movie does a great job reminding people that there is a foundation for womanhood. It starts with that transition. It starts with that, that change, that natural change when we first get our periods. And it doesn't end. You know, we all look different. We all have different stories. We all have different life experiences. But we all have that one thing in common. And that's what makes us women. And that's what makes us amazing. That female experience is so beautiful and it should be taught to young girls and it should be embraced. If you're not telling your daughter how amazing it is to be a woman, how beautiful puberty is, how beautiful that change is, how uniquely they're designed, you're failing as a parent and you need to do better. At the very least, you've got this movie to help you. Want to advertise on this podcast? Check the episode description to see how you can be featured on the next episode. Thank you once again for listening to me rant and rave about another movie. So that was Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. Just to sum it up, I loved it. If I had to pick top five favorite movies from this year, this is top five. Easy. Great performances. A great performance from our young lead. She's amazing in this. I love Rachel McAdams, Kathy Bates. Just a stellar cast. The, the casting in this was just great. Uh, beautifully shot in the city of Charlotte. Oh, random fact that I did not mention. So if you go and see this movie and you there's a scene with the library and you see the librarian i know her i know her her name is giselle fleming she is an actress if you've seen the uh movie war war room the christian film war room by the kendrick brothers if i'm not mistaken with priscilla schreier she was in that movie as well so there is a scene because Pris priscilla schreier plays a real estate agent and she's showing uh, I think clara's old house to another couple a pastor and his wife the pastor's wife is Giselle. She's a friend of mine and it's not like, oh, I knew her. No, I know her, know her. I haven't spoken to her in a couple of years since I've moved, but she is a very influential person in my life. She led me in a Bible study for many months, right? I'd say maybe a year or so before I moved. She, I've served with her. She's prayed over me. Someone that I've often just gone to talk to because I needed someone to help me sort out what I was feeling, my relationship with the Lord. Like she's just an incredible woman of God, a great actress, a great friend, just an amazing woman. So I had no idea that she was even in this. She's only in it for a second, but that second was enough to just light up my world, light up my whole world. So to know that so many people are gonna watch this movie and they'll get to see her face makes me so happy. So, uh, yeah, I'm so happy for her. I'm so proud of her. But I had no idea she was even in this. It makes sense because parts of the movie were shot and sh were filmed in Charlotte and she lives in the Charlotte metro area. So, you know, it, it, it makes sense that, you know, movies will, you know, scout out local talent or extras uh, for a movie. And because she is local, that means they don't have to pay for a hotel. They don't have to pay for travel or anything like that. Very cheap, very easy, especially for a role that's only like a hot second. But it was just amazing to see her face. It made me so happy. It just filled me with joy, um, unexpected joy. So yeah, that that was the cool part for me was seeing her face. So what's coming up? Well, today at some point, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing with the rest of my day. This is the earliest I've been done with filming a pod or recording a podcast. I've never been done this early. It's barely 10 o'clock. Never. I'm usually like, like panicking at... 11 30 to get everything put together and out um but yeah it, it just worked out this morning so i have no idea what i'm going to do with the rest of my day but at some point today i'm hoping to watch peter and wendy which is the movie that just dropped on um disney plus i have to look it up but i'm trying to think of another disney live action version of 
Peter Pan. I can't remember if Hook is Disney or not, but I don't think Hook counts. It's, yes, it's Peter Pan, but it's not Peter Pan like the cartoon version. It's, you know, this is Peter Pan as an adult who has forgotten all about the things and then has to go back and rescue his kids. If you've never seen Hook, I love it. The funny thing about Hook, though, is that, you know, whenever Steven Spielberg talks about Hook, he gets really embarrassed. He's actually not that proud of that movie. Oddly enough, which is crazy, though, because it's such a favorite. It's a nostalgic favorite. You know, it's a millennial favorite. Uh, you know, um, the man who plays Rufio, God, I cannot remember his name, but he will always be Rufio. And he always lights up whenever people see him in public and they yell, Rufio, stuff like that. But yeah, I can't think of any other live action Disney adaptation of Peter Pan. Now, some of you might be thinking, what about the one, you know, from 2003, which was with Jeremy Sumter, um, the dude who plays Lucius Malfoy, Jason Isaacs, um, and... Rachel Heard, Rachel Wood Heard, Heard Wood, something like that. I can't remember. I know it's something like that. She played Wendy. That, I think everyone, I've never met anyone that watched that movie and didn't love it. I thought I was the only person on the planet that absolutely loved that movie until TikTok. And I realized, holy crap, everyone loves this movie with Jeremy Sumter. And I think it's because Jeremy Sumter, I was about 15, 16. I was 16 when that movie came out. And he's about my age. So I think everyone had a crush on him essentially but yeah that's the adaptation i think a lot of people are thinking of but that's not disney um and i think it makes sense it's not disney because the movie's excellent and disney doesn't do very well with live, ad live action adaptations direct live ad ad action adaptations that's just my opinion but i can't think of another one so this really is this might be a first for disney i don't know i'll have to look it up i'll let you know once i do my review what i find but i will be watching that movie at some point today i'm sure i'll be watching love again next week in theaters that's a cute little rom-com i think something or other celine dion is in it the month of may y'all i just looked at the movies coming out in the month of may y'all may is so dang boring but that's the problem with May because who cares about the rest of May? It's all about Memorial Day weekend and The Little Mermaid, which from what I read is a limited release, which is strange to me and doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you limited release that? But that comes out Memorial Day weekend. And I don't know. I, I still haven't made up my mind. I don't want to see it. That's I'm just going to be frank with you about it. I have no desire, no interest whatsoever in seeing it. Um, the question is, do I want to watch it just so I can review it? That's the question. Do I want to waste my time? Because for me, it would be a waste of my time because I'm just, I don't want to see. It. I have no desire. The interest is not there. I don't care. But June is looking a lot better, but it's, we just got to get through the month of May, y'all. Cross your fingers. I apologize in advance because it's going to be some ratchet sounding movies. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but hey, we're going to get through it together. This is a team effort, right? Right? or not so this is actually the third review y'all are getting today um when this comes out you should already be able to see nefarious and the covenant so i love y'all very much y'all are amazing i hope you enjoy this last weekend in april and i will see y'all next month